Morning, joining church. Amen. Woo! We're kind of going to be talking about mental health issues, which really is not talked about too much in church. Amen? But the truth is, at our church, you can say, I have mental health issues. You've got mental health issues. We all have mental health issues. It's just a matter of how bad we have them. And with Christmas coming, sometimes our anxieties overcome our joy. Uh, we're just going to scratch the surface. I, I really don't think you can preach a message that would deal with mental health issues. I think what we do is try to just get some handles on how to better handle it. People say, well, what, what causes that? Well, there's so many things you don't know. Uh, sometimes I believe there's everything from the environment, what's in the environment today, to food, to drugs, to alcohol, to your genes, <clears throat> every, little uh, everything that comes into play. The sermon will not deal with the issues. It just hopefully give you some things to better handle it. I always say if you're on medication, <laughs> which most people are, don't forget to have meditation as well as medication. Amen? I know recently somebody that was really right with the Lord. I mean, better than almost anybody I know. They just, they were right with God. They were right with people and Yet they were just really struggling with depression and some bad thoughts in their life and got them to the doctor and they got on some of the right medication and, <clears throat> and right now they're doing really well. I know somebody else that was really struggling with some depression and went and had some testing done and they told them they didn't need to be on any medication. They need to do a little bit of exercise and take some vitamins and now they're doing great. I, I don't believe there's this one answer. I believe it's physical, I believe it's emotional, I believe it's spiritual, I believe that we're at least trichotomy, I believe we're body, soul, and spirit. I mean, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, it says that uh, take care of your spirit, soul, and body, and so we have to learn to treat all three. Uh, I should have a handout today that I changed the message, and I know Deb upstairs is excited, <clears throat> and I... Welcome to Alexander Campus. Amen. Woo! About 6 o'clock this morning, I, I, text, I sent this to Daryl, and Daryl's hopefully had a chance to run a copy out of it. And it says, Anxiety and Worry Worksheet. Because I know that when you leave every Sunday, you usually forget 80% of everything that I preach. So I thought if I could give you a worksheet, and we might work through that this morning, You'll have something to take home with you because everybody at some time or another will struggle with some anxieties. Amen? I mean, there's millions and millions of people, including Christians, that struggle with mental health issues and uh, depression and anxiety to only say a few of them. And uh, today, you're going to see David, a man after God's own heart. And David would often struggle with depression and anxiety. Uh, the psalmist said in Psalms 94, 18 and 19, David speaking, he said, I, I'm, I'm, I'm falling, he said, but your consistent love, oh God, held me up. Then he said, listen, whenever I'm anxious, whenever I have anxiety and worry, God, you comfort me and you make me glad. Now, here's an insight that I want you to get. And I'm going to tell you over and over and over, it's probably the key to the whole thing. David would acknowledge his problem, but then he would accept the help. And there's a big insight because so many people that struggle with anxiety and depression will acknowledge the problem but won't accept the help. And so if you, if you just simply acknowledge the problem and you don't accept the help, that's not fair to you and it's not fair to God. God has integrity. God has character. God says, cast all your cares on me because I care for you. So when you acknowledge the problem, make sure you're willing to accept the help. That help can be from God, of course. It may be from doctors, of course. It may be from counselors, of course. But don't simply acknowledge the problem without accepting the help. That is totally unacceptable. First thing you do, and I know you don't want to hear this because it's such a, Christian cliche, cliche, 
is you, you pray when you're going through anxiety. But in Philippians chapter 4, it tells you why. In Philippians 4, 6, it says, be anxious for nothing. In other words, you're going to have anxiety, but he's saying don't live a continual life of anxiety. So then it says, because in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. If you would paraphrase it, God has said, you're going to have times of anxiety. I don't want you to live in anxiety. I want you to learn to have prayer and supplication and be thanksgiving. Now, that God's Word is inspired, amen? But I believe not only God's Word is inspired, I believe the order of God's Word is inspired. See, a big part of dealing with anxiety is learning to train your mind, you ready, to be thankful for what you have. Because if you have the gene, and I'm learning, I just went through a DNA, our DNA seminar that if you have the gene of anxiety and depression, your mind will all, all automatically be drawn to the negative. It'll be drawn to the negative instead of the positive. So you have to train your mind to be thankful for what you have. And see, so when I read this, I thought, man, God, you're ahead of the doctors. Now the doctors are learning that you have to train your mind to do that. And so God's Word is saying you're going to have times that you're going to be anxious. You're going to have anxiety. When you have anxiety, train your mind to start being thankful for what you have. It may not come natural. So you have to say, God, overcome the gene or the draw to be negative and learn to be thankful for what God's given you. In other words, acknowledge the problem. Accept the help. And only then, verse 7 said, then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. You don't have to understand it. Will guard your heart and your mind through Jesus Christ. It says one of the things you have to learn to do is guard, protect uh, what goes into your mind, your thought pattern. It's, it's, it's a fortress. You almost had to build a fortress around your mind. And you have to do it over and over and over again. Then you ask God to guide you and, and direct you. Uh, you there, there's some prayers that you can pray. Uh, you can say something like, uh, I come to you as a child purchased in the blood of Jesus Christ. I declare my dependence upon you, O oh God. I acknowledge my need for you. I know apart from Christ I can do nothing. You know my thoughts. You know my intent in my heart. You know the situation that I'm, I'm in. I'm, you know the beginning and the end. I feel though I'm double-minded now. I know that your peace guardeth my heart and my mind. I humble myself before you, God. I choose to trust you and exalt me in the proper time that you choose. I place my trust in you. Supply all all my needs according to your riches. You guide me in all truth. I ask you to, for your divine guidance so that I may fulfill my calling. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me for all my anxious thoughts. See if there's any hurtful ways in me. you got to just talk to God. The psalmist said, in 139, 23, he said, Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. Know my anxiousness. David said, just know it. And see if there's any wicked way in me. So, so the first thing you do is pray, but the second thing you do, you ready? Settle any personal and spiritual conflict. Unresolved conflict causes anxiety, amen? When I have unresolved conflict, I have this unbelievable anxiety. It, it can be with my wife, it can be with a employee, it can be somebody at church, so many times at church or I'll have a c conflict with somebody and then I have anxiety till I, till I get back and it, it, sometimes we'll just call each other and say, you okay, I'm okay, you okay, but when we don't, I have, have anxiety and I can't control what somebody else does, but I can control what I do. I, I, I've had conflict with people, and even when I tried to settle it, they didn't want to settle it. But after I tried to do my best, then God would give me peace about it. And so don't go with unsettled conflict. 
there's also a spiritual conflict. Uh, 1 Timothy 4, 1 says this. Now the Spirit expressly says in the later times, listen, some will depart from the faith. They're giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. In other words, what, what it's saying is you've got to be very careful. Don't be double-minded and paying attention to deceiving spirits. There's, there's, there's God's spirit and there's deceiving spirits. They'll come unto you like light, but they're really darkness. And they'll deceive you. They'll bring confusion. They'll bring fear. They'll bring doubt. That doesn't come from God. God's not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So don't let the deceiving spirit come into your life. Uh, James 1, 8 says, don't be double-minded. Don't be unstable. A, 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 a double-minded person will pay attention, if you're not careful, to deceiving spirits. I mean, the world today is confusing. The world is trying to pull you away from God. The media is trying to deceive you. You've got to be really Holy Spirit perceptive what you're going into your mind. You, you need to have the presence of God to have the peace of God. Settle your conflict. Settle it spiritually. Settle it personally. Third, state the real problem. If you're having anxiety, your, your mind is running away with some problem. State the real problem. A problem well stated is halfway solved. Ask yourself, will this problem really matter in eternity? You just eliminated 90% of the problems. Half the problems I get anxiety over is not going to matter in eternity. It's self, you ready? I have a whole lot of self-imposed pressure, problem, and anxiety, but when I don't state it, it builds up, it's false, and it's deceiving. So what are you really struggling with right now that's going to really matter in eternity. State it. Fourth, divide the facts from assumption. This is so important. I'm telling y'all, Journey Church, y'all, it's not what we want from you today. It's what we want for you. We're trying to give you something that you can take home and you can use it over and over and over again. Some of y'all are going to be struggling with anxiety with Christmas coming. And anxiety leads to depression. A particular trait, and I got to see it in medical terms, there are certain genes. They can now track your genes in your mind, and some of the genes have a tendency to always assume the worst. It's called filtering. And it, you, you filter out the good, and you, 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 you focus on the worst. The assumption is to, instead of accepting the truth, you, you, you focus on that and it, and it brings unlimited anxiety. You make the presumption about tomorrow. You start worried about tomorrow. And so you suffer negative consequences. Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety, worry in the heart of a man causes what? What does is, what is worry and anxiety cause? Now, I want to tell you up front, there is spiritual depression and there's a chemical imbalance of depression. So don't ever let anybody simply tell you if you'd get right spiritually, you wouldn't be depressed. That's not true. But there's multitudes of people that are depressed because of spiritual also. You're not dealing with the things that I'm talking about. You're, you're letting your anxiety lead to your depression. You're, you're worried about tomorrow, which you cannot control. Uh, Jane, I mean, uh, Matthew 6, 34 says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow, worry about itself. It's sufficient. Another one says, don't be anxious about tomorrow. God will take care of tomorrow and he's going to take care of today. He tells us to quit worrying about tomorrow. Let's just worry about Sunday today. Amen? 
let's just have a great day in the Lord today. Amen? I mean, you could do that. Just enjoy today. You, you can't control tomorrow. Amen? You don't even know if you're going to be here tomorrow. Amen? And that's what God's trying to tell you. Let's enjoy today. God's going to take care of you today. Fifth, determine what you have the right or ability to control. Now, this is tricky. You're responsible only for what you, which you have the right and ability to control. Your sense of worth is tied only to what you have, uh, you're responsible for. But on the other hand, don't try to cast your responsibility on God. He'll give it back to you. There, there's a lot of people, instead of accepting their responsibility to get up, to go to work, to do what they're supposed to, I'm casting all my responsibility on God. That's not what it says. It says cast all your cares on God. You get up and get your butt to work. Amen? So that's not what it says. So you can't cast your responsibilities on God and then say, well, I'm just so anxious. No, no. You go to work and do the best you can, then you let God take care of everything else. When you're doing the best you can, then let God do everything else. That's what he's saying. You cast all your cares on God. Listen, listen to this. God's integrity is at stake on taking care of you. His character is at stake on taking care of you. He, he said, cast all your cares on me because I care for you. Six, list what your real responsibilities are. You need to commit yourself to being personally responsible for what you're called to and what you're obligated for. Seventh, the rest is God's responsibility. If you continue to have unbelievable anxiety after you've done all these, it's probably due, you ready? For you assuming responsibility God never intended on you having. One of the greatest reasons we have anxiety as Christians now is we're assuming responsibility that God never intended on us having. That God said, I want to take care of that. And you're saying, no, I'm going to take care of it. So God said, quit doing it. So I'm going to read Philippians 4, and then I'm going to give a real summary of my message that I was going to preach. But I wanted you all to have this. I want you to have something you can take home. Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing. Don't live in a state of anxiety. But in everything, prayer and supplication, practice being thankfulness. Let your request be made known unto God. Tell God what's bothering you. The peace of God will surpass all your understanding, but you've got to guard your heart and your mind through Jesus Christ. But then, finally, my brothers that are saved, think on different things. Think on what's true. Think on what's noble. In other words, train your mind what you're thinking on. Think on good things, pure things, lovely things. Think on whatever things. If there's good report, hmm, virtue. Praiseworthy, meditate. I told you, medication and meditation. Think on these things. God said, listen, I want you to train what you think on, and it will change the mood that you are in. Okay? All that was a worksheet. Everybody say amen. amen. All right. Y'all ready to rock on? Turn it on. Turn it on. Turn it on. James 3.10. We, we're, we're going through two messages in 23 minutes. Y'all can handle it, somebody said. Y'all rocking, huh? Y'all know what to do when you have anxiety. You got a worksheet, amen? amen? All right, you can take it home, and I promise you, you will need it. If you don't need it today, you'll need it Monday. Because we got a lot of people at our church that have a lot of anxiety. Don't act like you don't have it. A lot of it's brought on by your pastor. Amen. <laughs> I knew I'd get it. Amen. Okay, let's go. James 3.10 says, Out of the same mouth proceed both blessings and curse. Oh, my brother, it shouldn't be like that. you like, got to learn to control the conversation, and you'll control the situation. But the conversation I'm talking about, not the conversation with other people, I'm talking about the conversation you have with yourself. The conversation you have with yourself is way more important than the conversation you have with other people. You have to learn to control the conversation, it's, it's an internal conversation that brings both blessings and curse. David in the Bible greatly understood this. 
In fact, let me tell you what, David who wrote Psalms, or most of Psalms, he was the one that went from a shepherd to a king, amen? David was the one, when everybody else was afraid to fight Goliath, he said, I'll fight him. David not only fought Goliath, he killed Goliath. David became the king. What you don't know about David is, David struggled with anxiety and depression. David struggled with many, many mental health issues. He struggled sometimes with God being far from him, but yet the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. Because of time, I'd like to read through Psalms 13, 1 through 6. David speaking, he says, How long will you forget me, Lord? How long? Forever? Will you forget me? In other words, he said, How long have you turned your back on me? Are you going to do it forever? How long, how long, listen, how long must I worry? I I feel sad in my heart all day. He's saying, how long am I going to worry? How long am I going to have anxiety? How long am I going to be dread? How long am I going to feel sad in my heart? Is it going to be all day? And then he keeps saying, how long? How long are my enemies going to win over me? Do you think David's having a bad day or what? Amen. You ever felt like that? God, where are you at? God, what are you doing? I feel sad in my heart. I feel like the enemies are going to win over me. He's crying. He's pleading with God. Verse 3 says, Lord, look at me. Answer me. My God. Tell me, or I'm going to die. He's struggling, isn't he? He, I mean, he's pleading with God. Verse 4, he says, otherwise, my enemy is going to say, they've won. Those against me, they're going to rejoice. I've been defeated. I mean, he feels like he's about to give up. He's been defeated. He's crying out to God. He's telling God what the problem is. He's telling him how depressed he is. He's telling him how discouraged. He feels that God has abandoned him. God has not spoken yet. Look at the next verse, verse 5. <laughs> you ready? I trust in your love. My heart is happy. Because you say, how in the world do you go from how long, God? Where are you at? My heart is sad. God, you, you, have you abandoned me? Can you hear me? My enemy's going to defeat me. God did not speak. What happened? How do you go from acknowledging all your problems to saying, God, I trust you. You love me. My heart's happy. Because he changed from what he felt to what he knew. He changed from acknowledging how he felt to accepting God's help. God didn't speak. David changed to saying, hey, I'm going to accept your promise. I'm going to accept your presence. I'm going to claim your promises. And I'm going to tell you, every single day, God has promises. He's in your presence. And even though we can acknowledge our problems, God said, I want you to accept my help. And there's people here today that came in that you need to acknowledge your problems. But God says, I want you to know, I want you to trust in my love. I want you to have a happy heart. I want to save you. I want to deliver you. I want you to have victory. I want you to have health. I want you to have happiness. Verse 6 says, I'm going to sing to my Lord, you know, because he has taken care of me. Golly, is that wonderful? He was honest and comfortable enough to tell God how he felt, but he was smart enough and wise enough to turn his crying into claiming God's promises. He, was even, he, went, he went from crying to claiming to praising to thanking God. You ready? Many people are waiting on God. Truth is, in most cases, God's waiting on us. See, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know what you're waiting on. God's waiting on you. I, I, we're going to give you an invitation in a minute. To, you can come and acknowledge your problem. But would you accept his help? Uh, I, I know that, that 
you could have a gene of being a pessimist. It's true. I know now scientific fact and negativity automatically goes to your thought. You have something that's called a filter that if you're not careful, you filter out all the good. You have another that's called a, you go to the worst scenario, and, but all the help was the same. It comes to having the right self-talk. I'm going to give you one example of a self-talk, and I'm going to give an imitation, and you need to have the self-talk today. In Matthew 20, there was a woman who had suffered an issue of blood for 12 years. She came behind Jesus to touch the edge of his garment, but she said to herself, she had suffered how many years? 12. Today she sees Jesus. She decided to talk to herself. She said to herself, if I could only touch the cloak of Jesus, I'd get well. And I say, if you could only touch the glory of God, it could change your life. Jesus turned around. He saw her. She touched him. Courageous, my daughter. Your faith has made you well. At that very moment, she was healed. How long has she suffered her bleeding? 12 years. What changed her suffering and her anxiety and her bleeding? An internal conversation that led to the right action that changed her life for eternity, for that present, and for the rest of her life. I think that Jesus wants a touch. He wants to touch you. But I noticed something in that story. I, I, I preached on it many, many times. Jesus knew what was going on in the crowd. Jesus could have gone over and touched her. Jesus, you ready? Jesus moves only after we move. She had to move first. And I believe everybody in here has something that Jesus is waiting till you move. And then when you move, he'll move. I don't know what it is in your life. I don't know if it's anxiety. I don't know if it's pressure. I don't know if it's depression. I don't know if it's sickness. I don't know if it's financial. I don't know if it's marriage. I do know one thing. There is no way, and you know what, I'd go out of here and not make the move. Stand, let me pray for you. God, we're here today. You're here. And God, you're waiting for us to make our move. God, I want to be the first one to move. I want to move towards you, God. I want more of you. I want you to touch my life like never before. I want to have more power, more courage, more faith. God, I want it for our church. God, I want you to touch lives today. I want you to bring courageousness. I want you to cast out anxiety and depression and fear and doubt. God, I want you to heal emotionally, financially, spiritually. I want you to heal marriages. God, I want you to open the right doors for people's lives. I don't want anybody to go home the same way they came, God. Whether it's to join the church, get saved, follow through in baptism, God, whatever you laid upon the heart, God, let us make the first move where you can touch us and we'll go home different. We'll give you the honor and the glory. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.